Okay, that looks good. Okay, now this is a reasonable error. Why is it reasonable for the oxygen to be at the tail? Because it has a lone pair. We know that things with lone pairs can be nucleophiles. And why is it reasonable to put the head here? Because this has a positive charge. Remember, this is the case we were talking about of somebody with a positive charge and an incomplete octet. Well, this is the case where that acts as the electrophile. Something with a positive charge and an incomplete octet acts like an electrophile. Really, the only example of that you'll see in OCHEM is carbocation. So here we have a carbocation, which is a good electrophile. And you saw that since this is at the initial tail, it becomes positive. And since the carbon was at the initial head, it becomes neutral. Good. Now, uh, if we want to show the deprotonation, do we right. have to redo another step? Is Absolutely. Okay. How can we figure out whether we're done? Well, we should ask whether nature would be happy with these products. And nature would not be happy with this charge here. So if there's a way to get rid of that charge, nature would like to do it. Remember that for each step, first we should draw the mechanism, and then we should draw the products. Because it's the mechanism that tells okay, us what the products are. Uh, What's going to be the proper way? Is there a certain amount of steps that should be shown for a reaction like this? Um, let's see, I'm not quite sure if I follow you. Here we have the, uh, an intermediate from this step. It's perfectly acceptable to just redraw the iodide that we had from the per uh, previous okay. step. And now we can draw some arrows for these two things interacting with okay. each other. Yeah, yeah we don't need to recopy these all over again. Right. It's perfectly OK to draw the arrows uh, on the intermediates that you just got from the previous step to show the reaction for the next step. That's good, except the convention is that the tail should be on the negative charge, not directly on the iodine. All right. So this is our typical deprotonation reaction, as we already discussed. And that would give us these products. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so previously, we did an SN2 reaction, and we showed a deprotonation after that. Mm -hmm. And here we've done an SN1. We showed a deprotonation after that. Uh, a deprotonation can happen after any reaction. Just in general, if you do your main reaction, and you notice that you still have some charges, you should ask if you can do a protonation or a deprotonation to get rid of those charges. It doesn't matter what the mechanism, uh, what the reaction is that you just did. Any reaction that leaves charges, nature would like to get rid of those charges by protonating or deprotonating. All right, um, now uh, I think you saw this was going to be an SN1, um, but that means that first the leading group leaves, and only later does the water attack. Okay, and this is a perfectly acceptable way to show the water attacking. Uh, were we forming a stereocenter here? Um, no. That's why we didn't have to worry about wedges or dashes, but we should always check that. Um, so uh, we just draw that uh, like this. Okay, and it's useful to have slogans for what happens in these reactions. Well, in both of these reactions, the leaving group leaves and the nucleophile joins. Same exact thing in both reactions. The only difference is in SN2, they happen simultaneously, and in SN1, they happen sequentially. So would this alpha carbon be primary, secondary, or tertiary? Uh, primary. Because here's the alpha carbon, and it's attached to one other carbon chain. Uh, when you're ready, how about this alpha carbon? It's going to be secondary, because it's attached to two carbon chains. Notice it doesn't matter that one of the carbon chains is longer than the other. You just count how many carbon chains the alpha carbon is attached to. Notice how we're focusing on the alpha carbon. We want to know if the alpha carbon is primary, secondary, or tertiary. This, carbon, uh, uh, this beta carbon over here is primary, and this beta carbon over here is secondary. But for the most part, for uh, SN2 and SN1, we mainly just care about how substituted the alpha carbon is. Another name for this is how substituted the alpha carbon is. This is less substituted, and this is more substituted with um, carbon chains or alkyl groups. All right, 
So what type of alpha carbon do we have here? Tertiary. Good. While we're at it, we should look at a couple of uh, special cases here. Is the alpha carbon here primary, secondary, or tertiary? beta carbon, though. How many carbon chains is the beta carbon attached to? Three. Count carefully. Four. Yeah. The beta carbon here is attached to four <coughs> carbon chains. Well, the name for that is quaternary. Quaternary. That hasn't come up before because there's no way an alpha carbon could be quaternary. Because if you're attached to four carbon chains, there would be no room for the leaving group. Um, however, other carbons can be quaternary, so it's useful to know this term as well. This was actually mentioned in the handout. Uh, the handout mentions that you can't do an SN2 when the beta carbon is quaternary, because uh, what was the big obstacle to SN2? Steric hindrance. hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. Well, the most important steric hindrance is steric hindrance on the alpha carbon, but if you load lots and lots and lots of steric hindrance on the beta carbon, that'll mess you up too. Well, this is so sterically hindered, quaternary, that that would also shut down an SN2. All right, so it's also good to know this term, quaternary. Um, even though alpha carbons can't be quaternary, other carbons could, so that's a good thing to know. And you can see the symbols here are completely logical. Quaternary means you're attached to four carbon chains, primary means you're attached to one. There's one other thing that we should be familiar with. This is kind of a trick question. How many carbon chains is this alpha carbon attached to? Just to the methyl group. Now, let's take that a little slower. Now, how, there's no chains attached to Yeah, so how many carbon chains is the alpha carbon attached to? Zero. Zero. It's not attached to any. It does, it's, you, don't, you wouldn't say it's attached to itself. Sure. So um, I guess, uh, logically speaking, we should call this zero area. But unfortunately, not everyone is as logical as me. So they did not adopt the zero area uh, um, terminology. Instead, they call this a methyl carbon. And that, that's pretty logical, too, because we know methyl means one carbon. Um, so this is more terminology. And you can see alpha carbons could be methyl carbons. In fact, that's in the table. There's a row for methyl alpha carbons. So this could definitely come up on a problem. So um, there is something that's less substituted even than a primary. You could be less substituted than a primary if the alpha carbon is not attached to any carbon chains. So that would be methyl. Okay. Uh, so this would be a good time. This was a good time to do a little bit of review of primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, and methyl since we had a little trouble with that yeah. on this problem. And that's definitely one of the most important tools for figuring out what type of reaction. Anytime you're doing SN1, SN2, E1, or E2, one of the steps is to determine whether the alpha carbon is primary, secondary, tertiary, or methyl. So you can use the table. So we have to be uh, comfortable with that. Okay. So let's show the mechanism for this reaction.
Okay, so uh, point to your answer. Are we done? Yes. Okay. All right, most of those steps were good. There's still a couple problems, okay. so let's go through that. 